Okay, good evening everyone. I'd like to call the meeting to order since we have a quorum and please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you everyone for coming tonight to this special meeting. Tonight's topic is an important one, and it's one of the few things that the Board of Education of every town in Connecticut is entirely responsible for, and that's hiring the school system superintendents. We appreciate your input, and we are being recorded tonight for public viewing. Hiring a superintendent in Connecticut's important task. Uh, we considered five proposals when we went out and looked for a search firm to help us with advertising, recruiting, going out there looking for candidates. We looked at five, our committee interviewed three, and the board unanimously agreed to hire one, which was CABE, which is Connecticut Associations of Board of Education. Uh, CABE is an organization we do belong to. We pay $5,392 a year. Uh, to be a member of CABE, they provide us lots of legislation information, legal information, check our policy books, and most towns in Connecticut are members of CABE. Uh, I said we hired one. We also had a question as to why we didn't consider Center for School Change, and the reason we just consider that organization, they do not do superintendent searches. Uh, this superintendent search is going to cost us about $9,000. Uh, it was a low bid of the five organizations we looked at. That's not the main reason why it was chosen. One was certainly low bid, that's important to us, but CABE has a terrific reputation for looking for superintendents and helping districts. Uh, tonight's meeting is a special meeting, it's for informational purposes. It is not a debate. It's not a debate between us. It's not a debate with the public. It's an opportunity for CABE to come in and give us some information that lots of people have been asking about, shared superintendent, part-time superintendent, or full-time superintendent. There's been questions going around the community, questions been going around our own board. We're bringing in professionals to give us some information to help us make the decision on it. We will allow comments on agenda items from visitors before and following the presentation. We ask we will not accept any questions while Ms. Dr. Broderick is doing her presentation. The Board of Ed will deliberate in the hiring of a new superintendent in a non-meeting format. And that means it is not open to the public. And we do that to protect the professional careers and provide privacy to any individuals who are interested in applying for the job. There will be further opportunities for public comment when CABE conducts focus groups with our community. Uh, then CABE will provide to the Board of Education a superintendent profile as to what the community of East Granby is looking for in a new superintendent. That profile will be presented to board meeting. Uh, we will receive copies of it. You will receive copies of it. And from that point on, we will then go out. They will go out and advertise for the position. So there will be another opportunity to do that. Uh, any motion to vote on hiring a superintendent will be in public session and the votes will be by the members of the East Granby Board of Education. This is not a town meeting, it's not a referendum. We've been elected by the community of East Granby. The Board of Education will do the vote uh, at a time that the Board of Education decides to do a vote. I don't know when that time is going to be. So uh, with that said, we'd like to just move on. We want to be able to answer any questions we had about the process. And we'll now open it up to comments from visitors regarding agenda items. Paul. So I have my preferred statement here. Hopefully I keep under three minutes. I know you have a... You know, I'm not timing you. You can... You're not timing? You get over. Okay, so I'm sorry. Could you state your name and your address, please? What's that? Could you state your name and your address, please? I'm going to do that. So I'm Paul Calva, Turkey Hills Road. I've been here in town for about two years now. Uh, as most of you know, I regularly attend you know, the board of meetings here, and I also have a forum that I've created called East Granby Voices, where I uh, take in comments and I comment on and provide a synopsis for what goes on in these board meetings. It's uh, from my perspective, but I keep it factual. And uh, so we've had 300 members, so it's a, it's a great forum for getting input from people 
and it, the, one of the requirements is that you have to be a resident of the town to be part of that forum. So it's a really good place to go get input. I would encourage if you do haven't joined already to come join. It's an open forum. State your opinions. State you know talk about issues. My primary concern tonight is about our operating school expenses. Our budget here for the school is about 80% of the total budget of the town. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and uh, my personal thing is I support quality education. Well-rounded students, uh, the best curriculum that we can have for our experience. However, I also support fiscal prudence. And as part of that, I don't believe that the BOA is, BOE is doing enough to keep educational costs reasonable for our taxpayers. That's my primary concern with it. And part of the discussion tonight is about costs, whether we should have a part-time or a share or a full-time superintendent. So cost is uh, part of the discussions that we're going to have. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Uh, today, we spend about $19,290 per student. This is according to the Department of Education website. Uh, it's, they have a great portal. It's called the EdSite portal. You can get statistics on costs and performance at every school district in Connecticut. So, for example, again, we pay $19,290 per student. Our neighboring community, Granby, spends $15,353 per student. That's a difference of $3,937 per student. In the state report, which is the most current information that they have posted, our population at the time of this was 855 students. It may have changed, obviously, by now, but that's the last full annual reporting year that the state has on this website. Um, so if you take that difference of $3,937 and multiply it by our 855 students, that means that we're paying $3,366,135 more than Granby rates per student. And you divide that by the approximate 2,000 households that are here in East Granby, that equates to a tax burden for taxpayers of $1,683 more per household every year. Not just a one-time expense, but every single year we're paying that much more for our educational system here. And I notice you're looking at the clock, but I said I'm going to have some time. Three minutes, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I have handouts over on this table. I'll look at the clock and another from the, from the state website that has those statistics. They're supplied by the school district. They're verified, they're audited, they're not made up numbers by myself or, or anybody else. And, and you can access them yourself by going to the EdSite portal on the state of Connecticut. Okay, so tonight's discussion is about whether we're gonna, we should have full part-time or a shared superintendent. However, the bigger picture question is whether we should be exploring some other type of option such as regionalization school setup to reduce costs and expand student opportunities. So a shared superintendent would be a great first step in that process. I have been told that this topic here in town has been debated for decades. Um, some call regionalization or shared administration a dead horse issue here. Uh, I can't get, I'll tell you how many comments on EG voices that I get from town residents that said, you're kicking a dead horse, just quit it. Um, well, I wasn't here when the horse, the horse was killed, okay? And uh, based on my autopsy, I have some questions about uh, why the horse was killed, okay? I've only been here two years. All that stuff was done way in the past. I'm new to town as maybe some of these other people are, and I have questions that I don't have answers to. So the BOE previously did a study on regionalization. Uh, it's on EG Voices website. Uh, you can request it from this board if you want to. However, in my opinion, after looking at it, it's, it's, it's inaccurate, biased. Uh, they didn't take into account cost savings uh, of truly the options that were available for us for regionalization. Uh, but read it for yourself. Take a look at it, form your, form your own opinions about what's going on there. <clears throat> in the state's accountability index, 
uh, the same reporting years for all that data that I have in that table over there, which includes metrics for students' performance test scores, diversity scores, graduation rates, students continuing to college and expulsion to institute discipline rates. We scored in that particular year 79.6%, whereas 100% is like, you know, you're the best district out there in the state of Connecticut. Granby, who is $3,937 less than us, scored 83%. Many people here in, in town tell me that, you know, it's just a matter of our small enrollment. We have really small class sizes, a lot of people like that. Uh, and that I've heard that, you know, I know that we've won a, a number of awards here for our school system in town, which we should all be proud of. Uh, however, our costs are exorbitant. And according to the state's performance statistics, we're on par or, or just as, you know, per, as far as student performance, just as good as the Granby district. Okay? This is not, again, these are not my numbers. These are from the state of Connecticut. You can read them if you want and, and look them up. So, you know, there is no correlation that I know of between smaller class sizes and performance. Um, you, can, you can look for yourself for studies on this topic. My sister happened to be uh, a principal and superintendent in a school in Western Massachusetts. And when I posed this question to her, she says that it's pretty much irrelevant. Uh, it has, there are so many other factors. It is a factor, but it's not the major factor in performance, as the state reports over there will we'll show you folks. So every year we're paying $1,683 more per household for a system that gives us the same performance as a neighboring district and as well of a good, if less, or maybe even a better experience for students because Granby has more AP courses and, and, uh, more, and has a football team, okay, and other things. Okay, so today there are currently 19 regional school systems in Connecticut. So it's not like regionalization is something new to the state. Been around for a long time. Uh, some of those regionalized uh, have just regionalized their high school, which is what I'm promoting. I'm not promoting taking away pre-K, elementary school, middle school from, from the town. What I'm proposing is we have a very small high school population that might benefit. Excuse me, Paul, we're asking you for comments on agenda items. We've given you I more am. than three minutes. The agenda item we're is cost about, to the city, no, 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 to the town of Granby, Excuse me, and Paul. part of that is a shared superintendent. Please let me, oh, I'm almost Paul, done. How much time have we been on? We, I'm almost we said done. three minutes. I knew this Please was going to happen, Bob. Of course you did. Of course I, I did. I've got people here who would like to talk about How many on the board items? would like to have me finish what I have to say, which is going to take me two minutes? There we go. So as long as there's some people that want to hear what I want to say I'm, on the board. I'm the board chairman. Then, then finish. I know you're the board finish, chairman. Bob, I'm going to let you but finish. But there's people that want to hear what's, what, the, what the story is. Listen, I'm the board Please, chairman. I will let you respect. finish. And Get you, some input. And you've given your time. I asked at the beginning if I had more than three minutes. Agenda items. To speaking to agenda items. I am items. speaking to Go agenda items. Go ahead and finish, items. Paul. And then you're through Thank for the night. You. So. I've looked at some, you know, have just regionalized their high schools here. They've made significant cost reductions, improved student performance, and also students have more access to extracurricular activities, more AP courses. Okay. So combining populations reduces administrative costs, transportation costs, special, special education costs, which is a concern here because ours are pretty high. Okay. And they also share things besides superintendents. They shall correct curriculum consultants and other admin functions, as well as, you know, most of these people that look at a shared superintendent idea, their end goal is they're going to regionalize. And there's been a number, I mean, a wave number of districts in the U.S that they, have taken that, 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 have taken that approach. I posted all this on the East G Voices uh, 
Facebook site. Then people we can provide links and, and references to it all, Very so good. you can look at it. I'm not making it up. Okay, so you can go there, make your own decisions. Uh, you know, okay. So everybody here in town wants to beat me up. Thinks I'm against. Thinks I'm against education. I have a special needs daughter that I put through school and fought for her education. I was a soccer coach for a regional high school. I'm a product of a regional high school, so stop beating me up. I'm not beating you up. Okay. Long. Well, every we, time I come here, I get cut off. You don't want to hear the comments. I okay. heard. I, I let you talk off agenda for over three minutes on items that had nothing to do with what we're talking about tonight, Paul. Excuse me. <laughs> if you don't, I, if you don't I think us are part of this discussion, Bob, are you, you finished are now, Paul? You are mistaken. Okay. I'm you not are mistaken. mistaken. Do you have anything Cost, else? Why, why would be looking at a part-time or a shared superintendent if cost was not part of the equation? Cost why, why would we just go hire a full-time superintendent? Are you through? I'm not going to answer. You. We're not no, asking I questions. I am asking you questions not since you challenged me. It's not the topic we're discussing tonight. Okay. All right. Okay. Bob, is there Thank anything you. else? Are there any other, any, any other comments from the public? Uh, Paul, you've exhausted your time. Thank you. We'll see this if is anyone all, else like By the way, this is all on my East, anyway. East Grand Bay Voices yes. site along with the statistics and other information. Feel free to look at it. I promote Paul, are education. You, are you finished? Thank you very much. I am done. Appreciate it. Okay. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on the agenda items tonight? Yes. My name is Amanda Cormier. I live on 15 High Farm Road. Um, I grew up in East Grand Bay. I've lived here for 36 years. Um, I went to school here, and I came back with my husband eight years ago to raise our two daughters, who both go to the school. The reason we came back is because of the quality of education. So I was planning on speaking tight on the agenda item um, of the superintendent that, you know, I am in favor of keeping things how it is a full-time superintendent. Um, but since we got off course a little bit, I thought maybe I would also, since I work in a regional school, the school I work in is a regional middle and high school, so it's not elementary schools. Um, some of the um, things, Paul, that you talked about um, to expand student opportunities. The first thing was better extracurricular activities. Um, in East Granby, when through talking to people, East Granby currently has 13 different sports, including a unified sports program. Those do include some um, co-op sports. In the regional school that I work in, in Connecticut, by the way, I work in Connecticut, not a different state. We have the same exact sports opportunities and the unified um, sports, so there's nothing different in my region versus what East Granby currently offers. Um, as far as travel opportunities, East Granby offers more than what my school offers. Um, moving on to, um, he mentioned there would be more opportunity for AP courses if we regionalize. Um, currently, East Granby offers 14 um, AP courses. That's currently this year. And my school, currently a regional school in Connecticut, offers 11. So we actually offer less than East Granby does. He talked about reducing administration costs. As far as superintendents in East Granby, we have one full-time superintendent. At my regional school in Connecticut, we currently have a full-time superintendent for middle and high school, a full-time superintendent for one of the four um, districts, and three part-time superintendents for one of each other districts. So we actually have five, four, and, and then the, the so five superintendents in a regional school district. So I'm not sure how that would reduce the administration costs. So um, just based off of his things, I thought I would go off a little bit and I had some information prepared that are facts, not opinions. Thank you. Do we have anyone else who'd like to make a comment on the agenda items? Okay, seeing none, after the meeting, you'll have an opportunity again to make some comments or ask our visitors some questions. I'd like to now introduce uh, Dr. Mary Broderick. She's from the Connecticut Associations of Board of Education. And Mary's going to do a presentation on those three topics. We're talking about shared superintendent, part-time superintendent, and a full-time superintendent, and the ramifications and feasibilities of all three. Mary, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, good evening to all of you. I'm delighted to be here this <coughs> um, And delighted to be working with the East Strand Board and the community in figuring out who the right person is to work with you to move this district forward in a really constructive way. Uh, when we were talking um, a little while ago, and this, it was very clear that the issue of do we want to go to a part-time superintendency has been percolating here for a while, 
I mentioned to Bob um, that I had done a study um, with Preston, which is a small community in the eastern part of the state, examining the part-time superintendency and you know, just, just getting a sense of, of um, why communities have chosen to go that way, what they look like, and that kind of thing. Because Preston was trying to decide whether it wanted to go to a part-time superintendency. So what I'm planning to do in the next few minutes is give you a sense of what we talked about and where, where Preston ended up. I don't have a horse in this, in this issue, um, but I'm here to make sure that you feel as thoughtful and con that the decision has been thoughtfully considered. Um, which I know it, you've been working on that for a while in terms of doing a um, regionalization study and so on. So, I'm going to give you a little information at this point. Um, it, when the state of Connecticut, can you see that? Should we this is a little bit of a way to. Can we shut off half the lights? There you go. That'll do it. Is that better? That's better. Yeah. So, I think you're good. That's really good. Is that good? Yeah. Everyone's okay with the back? No, no. This, it is small. Um, it get, gets a little bit bigger later, and it's, I'll be covering most of it, so you'll hear it coming. When Connecticut decided to require school districts to be overseen by superintendents, there were a lot of small communities. There were 166 school districts in the state of Connecticut. Actually, it's more than that now with our. Um, with some of the magnets and, and charter schools. But traditionally it was 1966. And so the state of Connecticut actually hired itinerant superintendents who went from town to town and served as these small towns overseers of their instructional program. But increasingly these little towns were not very happy with having these part-time people kind of carpetbagging, coming into town and overseeing their schools and then leaving and going on to the next town. So the state at that point said, fine, we will support you in hiring part-time superintendents. And they were paying for them. And then they stopped paying for them and assumed that the small towns would pick up that role. So today, there are actually um, 21 part-time superintendents in the state. This study was conducted in 2016, August of 2016, so it's three years ago now. And what we found was, um, with interviewing 18 of those 21 part-time superintendents, all who were available the first two weeks of July in 2016, and you can see there are the list of, um, you may not be able to see, but there is the list of communities we spoke with as part of this study up there. Um, we gathered quite a bit of helpful information. This is going to be really easy for you to read. But what this is, and I, I sort of intentionally left it up there all in one slide, is what the Connecticut Association of Boards of Education, or CABE, and the Connecticut Association of Public School Superintendents, or CAPS, together said are the responsibilities of a superintendent of schools. I'm this sorry, I'm sorry, Mary, could you just go back to the last slide? Sure. I'm sorry. And those towns would then be in, all of them in uh, regional districts? Then. They're not all in regional districts. Um, I think eight of them are in regional districts, and 12 of the 21 are in I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm just looking at the ones that are listed there. Right. Which are the ones I've spoken with. Right. But they're not all regional. So Salem, for instance, is not regional. Okay. Thanks. Um, but eight of them are. Okay. So um, the point of, of this, and I, you know, I'm happy to share this with anybody who wants to see it, is there are a lot of responsibilities. Um, of a superintendent. Overseeing the educational program first and foremost. Finances, a big one, um, you know, making sure the budget is done right, but overseeing your principals, overseeing all of your administrators, making sure that um, their evaluation plans are in place, that their contracts are negotiated, etc. There are tons of responsibilities for superintendents. And those expectations don't change from full-time to part-time superintendents. In addition, what's not even mentioned here is relations with the community, which may be one of the most important 
um, you know, developing relationships that are constructive for with the board and with the community. Um, I'm happy to share that. So the key variables in making this decision as far as Preston was concerned is what's your enrollment in general? How many of those students enrolled are receiving special services? How many sites you have? Do you, how many schools? Um, what your annual budgets are? What your per student expenditure is? To Paul's point. How part time is defined? And then um, what your administrative staffing is? There is more in the study that we did together, but those were the um, key variables in their making the decision. Now, all of the information that was collected, and again, um, John, you'll see that second column there is regional or pre-K through 12, um, and it was eight are regional and 12 were pre-K through 12. And then I include, so I have the mean and the median and the minimum and the maximum, and then Preston as it was making its decision, and then East Granby, okay? So if you look at total enrollment, the mean of those that have part-time superintendents was 357 students. And that's pre-K through 12. So that includes those who tuition students to a high school, okay? The median was, so the middle of the, of the pack was uh, about a 373 student enrollment. The minimum was 81 students in Union, Connecticut. The um, maximum was 620, and that's Salem, Connecticut. And then Preston was a little higher than that at 640. You have 848 students as of your most recent document that Paul was referencing. Um, the, is, is that the correct figure? It's right, right around there. 890 or something. 890. So it's, it's, it's up there higher than 848. Okay. It's lower. No, it's lower than that. Is it lower than that? Yeah. We have 65 choice students. So the numbers receiving special services, you'll see the mean for the districts was uh, 44, the median was 37, the mac uh, minimum was 14, the maximum was 103, and Preston was right up there with Salem, which had the largest enrollment at 103. The data I've gathered said you had 110. Now again, this is your, your last, most recent um, document filed with the state. So. Same right over there if you want. If you look at the number of sites, the mean was one site, meaning one school. Um, there was actually only one district, and it was a regional district, that had two schools. And that was Chaplin, which had a pre-K through six school, and then a regional high school that was seven through 12 shared with two other towns with one half-time superintendent covering all of that. Um, Preston had two schools in an elementary school and a middle school. And East Granby has four. When I talked, <coughs> as part of this study, I also talked with um, Joe Sarasolo, who at the time was the executive director of the Connecticut Association of Public School Superintendents. And I was saying, I was kind of going through my list of questions, and he was saying about Preston. Oh yeah, they could, they could go part-time, they could go, they could deal with part-time. How many, how many schools are there? I said two. Oh no, they can't. They can't go to part-time. You can't do multiple sites and have a part-time superintendent. That was his perspective. So that there you see East Granby would be a big outlier in terms of a part-time superintendency compared to the other districts. In terms of annual budget, you'll see the spread there as well. The mean for the part-time is $5.5 million budget. Um, even Preston had an $11.2 million budget. Um, East Granby at this time was 17.7. Um, and then if you look at the approximate per student expenditure, now again, these, the figures that I am using for the other districts are 2016 figures, so they're old data. The East Granby are the most recent I can find. I would say there's not too much of a difference in your per student expenditure between 
the um, Preston and the East Grand Beach at this point. All right, so that gives you kind of the lay of the land in comparison to the other communities in the, in the study. How was part-time defined was one of the considerations, and it was usually days. So a superintendent in union, which has 81 students, works 65 days a year. Uh, most of the communities had more like 108 days, something along those lines. Um, but it is very important that expectations be seriously rolled back for the role if you are going to be at fewer days. So um, the other consideration in terms of part-time is your market for potential candidates to serve in the role of superintendent. It's a very different field. Um, the part-time superintendency is usually a retired, experienced <coughs> superintendent. Um, and they have varying levels of energy, and, um, but I will say they all talked about being on 24-7, even though they only worked one or two, <coughs> two and a half days a week. The other major concern, and especially as Preston was moving in this direction, we didn't really have any experience with a new law that the state had imposed which said um, no retired individual could be paid more than, bear with me, 220% of your top teacher's salary times 0.45. So the total amount of a, an administrator could be paid if they're receiving retirement <coughs> would be limited. It's capped. Um, so that may be compromising the pool of retired candidates, but it's it's still kind of early to determine that, <coughs> to tell. Um, administrative staffing is a really important consideration. Um, you have, when you're in a really small district, and you probably know this because East Granby is a small district, you really have to rely on the skills and talent of everybody in your system, especially your administrators. And you need to figure out how you're going to accomplish the work that needs to be done in a, an excellent school system um, who has what you, what you need, who has what you need technologically, who has what you need in terms of curriculum, who, who brings what to the table, and how do you, and figuring that out is one of the most important challenges of a part-time superintendent. Um, if a superintendent's not there to be guiding the day-to-day -day operations, it becomes especially critical. Um, in 16 of the 18 districts who, were, who um, contributed to the study, they had one full-time principal. Uh, and all, again, all of them just had one school. But it was really difficult for part-time superintendents to mentor. And if you had new, newer principals, that was especially difficult. <coughs> Um, who manages collective bargaining, who takes care of a lot of the day-to-day -day functioning and operations of both the school board and the school district. So you also need to be really seriously thinking about what your special ed staffing looks like, how you're staying on top of laws, which are changing all the time and are really important, how you are um, guiding curriculum, who's doing your curriculum development if it's not your superintendent overseeing it, who's taking care of your business operations, um, those are all things to, to be keeping in mind as you consider moving in the, um, if you're considering a change. Um, let's see. And, and what's managed in-house and what's outsourced. Is your transportation in-house or your food services in-house? What's your technology? facilities and um, maintenance and that kind of thing. So the themes that really came up um, doing this study were why go the part-time route? What do you lose? What do you gain? Um, how can you have the, mo the strongest, most effective administrative team and support staff? Um, the one issue that came up that other uh, communities have dealt with at times is, well, do we have a superintendent slash principal? And the message across the board was, don't go that route. It just gets too confusing about what role you're serving and you know when do people come to you and when do they not and that kind of thing. 
There's one school district in Connecticut that was just moving to that model for the first time when I was doing this study. I don't know what their track record is since then. But that was something that people said, avoid at all costs. And then um, the availability of individuals for the work is something that I've already talked about. So questions that emerged from this study and that you might want to be considering. What do you want to look like in five years and in 10 years? Um, if you're looking at the long term, what would be a compelling reason to go to a part-time position? Are you prepared to lose the capacity of a full-time superintendent? And what are the implications of that? What would you be prepared to see dropped? Because you will find that there will be things dropped. And what changes would the district make to the job expectations and the administrative structure to make, to make this a successful change? Uh, what possible cost exposure is there if you don't have a full-time superintendent? Like costs to outsource functions, um, stipends to others who might have administrative certification and could carry some of the administrative role, um, and additional staffing possibly. And then um, the final question is, what quality candidate could East Grand be attract? So that um, concludes what um, I had prepared to share with you about this, the part-time superintendency in Connecticut, the status of it as of August 2016, and um, have started collecting your thoughts from prior and would like to um, maybe even just stand here and take down what people have to say that you consider. Could I just hear real yeah. quick? How did Preston? Oh, what they got? I really have to tell you, as I went with this report to the board, to the committee that was considering it, I had no idea what they were going to decide to do. Uh -huh. And they hired a full-time superintendent. Yeah. So, you showed it, and I think it's important to quickly <coughs> reiterate. So the individuals would be similar to our hire, Dr. Charles, when we hired her as interim superintendent. And it's an individual right. who's retired from right. similar position. They've elected, at whatever age they've elected to do so, to go and on their pension. And then once they're on their pension, then they're limited by state statute as to their uh, functioning, so that would make them quote unquote part time, or with our need, it was interim, so it was X number of months. Um, That's right. I don't know if it's days, months, or or hours, but it's, it was limited it's, by it's by those uh, by criteria. That yeah. Okay. So, if you had this individual, I mean, in, in a town like Preston, and you sort of alluded to it there, so that's not a long term decision. I mean, if we're hiring someone that is a retired superintendent, presumably they're maybe my age or maybe a year or two older, okay? I mean, are they? Are we hiring someone for two years? Are we hiring someone for five years? Or are we hiring someone that's gonna take our district, I don't mean to be cliche-ish, but into the 2030s? I, I, I will, um, I do think there yeah, have been- Certainly something to consider. Yeah. Well, actually, I was just going to say, I think there have been some who have really been dynamic and have moved districts forward, but that person was full-time, so. I mean, um, I just don't know what, it, it, what, you know. They, I do have tenure data from this study, so from 2016 for you. Um, they found that people would stay on average about five years. So that's probably comparable to, it, and urban districts, tenure is shorter in general. Right. Connecticut may be a little bit better than nationally, but um, five years is probably pretty average. Um, do I see the energy behind really moving the district forward in this? I, I wouldn't say I have seen that, the, the, that energy. Our district? 
I'm not talking about these grandi. I'm talking about in, among part-time superintendents. Part in general, right. what you've seen over time. It, so. It's more of a, I don't want to. I, I'll call it that. It could be a caretaker. I think it's system. very hard and then to, the, to be the educational leader on a part-time basis. I don't know what their stake in the, in the game is. So well, would be and a, people, a people feel like they are living their passions. This is their passion. And it gives them an opportunity to extend it on a <coughs> less demanding schedule. They play a lot of golf. We're, we're, but we're, they're on 24-7. I think everybody in this room knows that it's a demanding district for our superintendents and has been. It certainly has been that way for as long as I've been in town. There, it, it's not, there's no assistant superintendent. The business office consists of a business manager and an accounts payable clerk. The superintendent in our district is, is wearing multiple hats, just a, a good way to say it, say it. And then, you know, if you're looking at someone who's not that dynamic person, okay, then we're in a position where suddenly we have to consider, well, do we need someone to assist the business manager? Do we need an assistant superintendent? Which a lot of districts, including districts that are our size, in fact, employ. And, you know, I look at that and I say, well, I'd rather have, you know, easy for me to say that, but, so those are but those are considerations which, which you definitely had up on the board, and I appreciate you you're pointing those out there. So what you're saying is basically if you have a, uh, a superintendent that is less than dynamic or just doesn't have the, the energy level, then you might have to hire a whole slew of support staff, which would end up costing more than if you just had a, a single, like, full-time superintendent that was, you know, and the, the fact that you may not be able to attract a top drawer superintendent if you don't have that kind of full-time position on offer. Uh, you might get someone who is uh, retired or, or just a second tier or something like that. I think if you go part-time superintendent, you probably, your pool probably is, you probably want your pool to be retired superintendents. Because um, a mid-career person who wants to go to a, a position like this might have some other issues. Did your study quantify the increase in costs? You're asking us to consider additional costs. In, in general, mm -hmm. the um, districts that were tiny mm -hmm. had higher per student expenditures. The districts that had to tuition out the students had mm -hmm. higher per student expenditures because it's more to educate a high school student than it is to educate an elementary student. So if it's if they were a regional district of a, a K-12 region. So if they were part of a regional district, the region covered the additional, the high school level tuition. They taxed it differently. Mm -hmm. um, but if they were paying tuition, their per student expenditure was higher <coughs> for high school. In other words, if we were to tuition out to, say, Grandy, for example, we would it's, end up paying more rather than less. It's possible. Mm -hmm. not, not according to what Grandy as per high school student though. Well, you don't know what kind of an agreement. Right. I should also, maybe, full disclosure. Full disclosure, um, I served for 22 years on the East Line Board of Education and worked out one of the first cooperative agreements. And that was between Salem and East Line. Their students had been coming to our high school for 30 years. And we had a handshake agreement. So we put the <laughs> We put something in place that gave, we hammered out, um, not regionalization, because it was too costly for everybody to go the regionalization route, but we did a cooperative agreement. But we had a long-standing relationship. We were very similar communities, and it worked. There are a lot of other communities that have attempted to go that route, and they're just, it's been too hard to level the playing field and not to have one feel like an inferior, partner, um, there were just a lot of issues. We were fortunate to be able to hammer that out, but we looked at the whole spectrum from regionalization to going our separate ways. Um, Sorry, Mary, you said East Lyme and what was the Salem. Way? And Salem. <coughs> and so how did that cooperative agreement work? Was um, between those two towns? We, we developed a contract between the two towns for Salem to send their students to East Lyme High School, but they had been coming to East Lyme High School for 30 years. 
So, so then it was finally formalized in writing. Right. And we needed a construction project, and we had to kick them out otherwise. So they needed to know that they could continue to come for 20 years before they were going to contribute to the construction project. Anyway, so, so, that's, so by using that cooperative agreement, did that supersede or get around tuitioning out? They, the town paid tuition to Eastline. The town of Salem paid tuition to Eastline. And the contract determined what that amount would be. And it took a, a good year of hammering out that, uh, that agreement. Mary, we, we've been informally talking with communities about ways we can do things and sharing resources of some type. But my question, I guess, you brought up regionalization. Is the state offering any incentives for school systems to regionalize today? And when was the last time a school system in Connecticut actually did regionalize? Not, I'll tell you, the barriers to regionalization are very high. It's really expensive to um, have to buy into each other's facilities which is a major component of regionalization. It's been a good, probably, I don't have the specific date, but I don't think it's been in my Board of Ed lifetime, which goes back to 1989. Um, I think 19 was the last one to regionalize. So it's been a long time. Um, Any state incentives? The state incentives, I think, the, st the incentives from the state apply for us in the Salem East Lawn Cooperative Agreement. I think you'll see more around cooperative agreements now. Um, meant that they had a higher reimbursement from the state than we did. We got to use their educational cost sharing amount and we, we blended them and added 10 points. So they were about 10 points higher than we were. Say we were 45, they were 55, we went to 50 and then the, the state added 10 points. They are, I think they've really been backing away from doing that kind of incentive, except they do want school districts to find cooperative services. Cooperative services really has to be something that's going to benefit both communities and the kids, first and foremost. Um, so if you can figure out, find those opportunities, they're worth exploring. I mean, our, our remit is to uh to maximize the student outcomes, uh, and, and that is our, our job and not something else. So it's just uh, everything, we have to bear that in mind. That is what we are here to do. That's what we were elected to do. Absolutely. You were the students. Legally. Um, yeah. Do any questions from the public would like to have you be able to join in? Paul, go ahead. So I talked to Patricia Charles, our part-time so I wouldn't call her part-time. We paid her part-time. That's beyond that. That I'll agree so to. I talked to her. And she, I think she would be, uh, you know, her comment to me was, I'd do this for a while. I like it. I'm a, you know. But because of the state law, God knows how that got put into place on the restriction of, you know, retired superintendents. Tammy, I would hope that that's something that we could petition to change because it makes no sense if you draw, whatsoever. I'm sorry, if, you're, if you're drawing pension money and then you're working full-time position, it's pretty straightforward. I work for, really the, I work for the state of Arizona. I work for the state of Arizona. After one year, I could go back and work full-time for the state of Arizona and collect my pension and get paid a full-time salary. So it's not like it's something that nobody does anywhere. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I don't see a question. Yeah, it's a does it, I agree. Gentleman have it. It wasn't a question. It was a Excuse comment. Me. We didn't ask for a comment, Paul. Do we have a question over here, sir? No? Anyone else have a question or comment? Yes, sir. First of all, I'll Jim. thank uh, Jim Franklin, head of Lane. First of all, uh, Bob, thank you for uh, emphasizing that the, the Board of Ed will make the decision in open session. And in prior years in East Granby, that has not been done. And I believe that is a, a violation of state statutes. But thank you for, for uh, let's, um, mentioning that during your during your open se session. Uh, you did, uh, thank you, Mary, for your presentation on, on part-time. You only began to talk about shared superintendents, and that's a possibility. Uh, um, I understand that statutes allow for boards of education to collaborate in the hiring of superintendents. And I, I understand that uh, Granby is also looking for a superintendent. Dr. Adley, who was, uh, I think, president of CAPS last year. Mm -hmm. 
uh, has since moved to, I believe, Darien. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that that is a potential for being explored. Um, uh, the, uh, the question I have is, uh, what are the certification requirements for superintendents? Superintendents have to have a, what's called an O93, which is a state certification. And that's what they have to have, which includes having taught for five years um, and then coursework and um, what is the O93. O93. O93, yeah. O93 certification. And you need O92 to be an administrator. Five years teaching and the O93 designation. Right, which is which requires a lot of coursework. Yeah. And if you're not certified to be a superintendent, you can get a 90 90 day waiver from the how, how does that work? The State Department of Education, the commissioner. The commissioner. We need to examine your credentials and make sure that you're close. Um, and that you would be able to serve in the role for a short period of time. What short? One year. Question over there is one year. Stephanie Mullane, so. Longview Drive. Um, my question to you is um, we're discussing the language of part time versus shared. Can you shed a little more light on what that looked like? How does how does one that is shared amongst districts not be part-time? Or is that the answer? Are they part-time based on being shared between districts? Paid as full-time responsibility shared amongst you know, the districts? The only one I know of that is shared, I'm trying, I'm thinking about my knowledge of districts around the state. And I think the only example is in Chaplin where you have the Chaplin School Board, which covers the pre-K through six school, mm -hmm. and then the regional district, Parish Hill, um, it's regional district 11, which is Hampton, Scotland, and Chaplin High School, uh, uh, 712. And it's one person who oversees both those boards and is 0.5. So you would agree that that would be in a different scenario that, than we are here in East Granby, in the sense that we we are not structured in that way that you're describing currently. You're not at the current time. Correct. Thank you. Um, the only, I'm trying to think, well, the other, um, <laughs> there are regional districts where the, I'm thinking of Region 1. Anybody here know Region 1? It's six towns, each with its own board, a regional board overseeing the high school, and an all boards chair committee. The chairs of all the boards, with one superintendent covering all of it. Mm. What, what is that? What is Region 1? Region 1 is the first regional school district in the state, and it is because it's tiny towns in Litchfield County. It's the small communities in the northwest corner of the state. So it is a regional district. So in a way, regional districts do serve that kind of part-time, the different towns role. But the itinerant superintendents were full-time. They were shared by multiple communities. And it was not favorable. The people in the communities wanted more of a sense of ownership of their schools. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Tammy Salastowski, Seymour Road. I had a question on, you had a chart up there earlier that um, gave comparisons, um, including the means, medians. You, you had a combination of both pre-K through 12 districts and regional districts. Is it possible to get the data just for the full range districts and not compare well, just apples or oranges? It's a little bit confusing because there wasn't a single, Chaplin is the only community that had one superintendent overseeing pre-K through 12, okay? And that's the situation I just mentioned. Is all the other part-time superintendencies were really covering the elementary middle school level. They weren't covering the high school. The kids either were part of a regional district for high school or they were um, tuitioned to Norwich Free Academy, 
East Lyme or some other high school decision, like um, you know, maybe, I don't think any was up in, there were a couple of quasi-public schools that they might have been tuition. Okay, I, I wasn't clear when you, you mentioned some of those were pre-K through 12 systems you were talking about. You, well, I didn't get that some of them were tuition out. The, the state designates them either pre-K through six, which then go on to a regional middle school, high school, or pre-K through 12, where it's a pre-K eight school and then they're tuitioned to a high school. Okay. It's confusing. Um, but that's it, but they're all it, it, not if you're not a pre-k through six with a regional high school you're considered a pre-k through 12 because the board is responsible for every one of the children okay thank you K through 12 so thank you so mm -hmm. under that type of scenario you're still going to have a superintendent for pre-k through eight and then you're going to share an expense of whatever district you've aligned with, co-opted with, shared with, merged with, regionalized with, whatever other term you want to use, you're still going to have the shared cost of the superintendent that's running that, that district. You're going to be essentially in two districts. Your high school children are going to be in the regional school district to which you're going to have expense and costs there. And then you're still going to have your pre-K eight district, and you're still going to have your responsibility of having a superintendent and adequate management for that district. You're going to have two districts. You're going to have additional costs that's going to be caused by having now for our school children two school districts, the in-town school district, and then whatever district we might find our way off to. Would that be an accurate statement? Yes, it, it would be. And you need, you need to get very clear also if you're in a shared services arrangement about roles and responsibilities and helping and, and funding and how well that, it's very complicated and it really needs to, in, well, yes, that's it. And not only that, all our potential partners close by are much larger districts, so we would probably be the junior partner in any uh, combination which would result in our uh, losing the local control, so we would have uh, part of the control but all the expense, um, or maybe none of the control. Mm -hmm. We would always be a minority voice on whatever shared regional mm -hmm. board. To, to that point, I've always been a little bit intrigued that having been an East Line Board of Education member and having put together this very successful agreement with Salem, that the Salem board never asked and we had a wonderful superintendent. And the Salem board never asked to have the superintendent cover their one school as well as our five. And I think it was because the town didn't want to lose that sense of control, for lack of a better word, over what happened for their kids. Um, we were doing great stuff, but that was their center of community and they didn't want to lose that center of community. I think that's what happened. That's why they've never come to East Lyme and said, you know, we did the work to put this cooperative agreement in place. It's working great. Our kids are getting a wonderful experience as a result of coming to your high school. We're looking for a new superintendent. Why don't you just take on one more school? They have never asked in the 23 years that we've had that cooperative agreement. So Salem has its own superintendent just for their grade school? Part-time, but it's, it's pre-K oh, but, it, but it's a part-time superintendent? Yeah, pre-K okay. And that's K through six or through the middle school? Pre-K eight. Pre eight. Okay. So is that the, the only example you have in the state of Connecticut that has successfully worked out where you had uh, pre-K through eight remain in the town, and then the high school students 9 through 12 would be either shared with another district or... No, I mean, there are, there, these are all examples, of, but they all have the... Well, the ones that you mentioned earlier, I think you said there were so 19 of them? There, yeah, that, well, there are 21, okay. and the ones who participated in the study Basra sends its kids to Netanyahu Tree Academy. Um, Eastford 
I don't remember where East Chris kids go. Oh, I, um, one of the, they, they tuition them. I'm sorry? Aren't they with Ashford? Well, Ashford's also an elementary. Um, no, Ashford's yeah, regional. Travel. Eastford's not regional. Eastford, I think, goes to. Move on the parish yet? Some may. Some may go to parish. I think they go, they tuition them to a number of the different schools. Off the window. Window, yeah. yeah. Some of the regional ones are high school, really, right? correct? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. So Franklin also goes to North Tree Academy. Lisbon goes to North Tree Academy. Pomfret goes to um, the independent school, the quasi public school of Woodstock. Woodstock, thank you. Yes, Woodstock. Um, Salem goes to East Line. Sherman, I'm not sure which one Sherman. And Sherman and Sprague goes to North Tree Academy. And Union probably goes to Woodstock. So. We have a couple questions out there. I just wanted to add one more thing to the um, superintendent thing. So the district that I work in, just because I heard over there, um, we have in our eight through t seven through twelve, we have a full time superintendent, and then we have four elementary schools, K through six. In the largest of our four districts that are coming in is smaller than East Granby, and they have a full time superintendent for them. And then the other three each have a part-time superintendent. So I think that's important for people who have kids going to the school to know. I don't know how that would possibly save money to have two full-time superintendents and three part-time superintendents. And that district that is a little smaller than us, about the same size, who has a full-time, they need that full-time. And then our 7 through 12 definitely needs a, a full-time. So that's five. So I just wanted to make that clear again because... <coughs> I think you thought there was only one regional school. That's how most of them, the regional schools are. So five, five superintendents. A question on participation. I, I recognize Bob's comment. If we're part of a regional district and we're the smallest, we'd have the least amount of representation. But if we tuitioned our students somewhere, what kind of representation, mm -hmm. if any, would we have? Well, if you are just tuitioning them to a place like Norwich Free Academy, um, you wouldn't have any because that has its own board and you just pay the tuition. And even if your kids get expelled, you may not get your tuition money back. And mm -hmm. Anyway, there are some interesting issues there. Um, in East Line, we created an agreement that um, allows for our boards to come together as a, we call it a um, cooperative agreement meeting twice a year. So the boards come together and discuss any issues about the oversight of the high school that they're concerned about or that we're concerned about. And, uh, so, and yet they're, and they can give input. So we try to make it as East Line, as the bigger community, Try to make it as user friendly as possible, and try try to make Salem feel as if they had as much stake in um, the high school as possible. But it was the East Line. It's still East Line High School. It's not East Line Salem High School. So Salem has been a part of that community at the high school level forever. Um, really, always since East Line High School was built. Um, so it's different, but we do try to give them as much within legal parameters, but it's minimal. Thank you. Thank you. I think you have a question. Unless, ma'am, you're back there. Uh, so a lot of this is focused financially, not academically, not business-wise. So on a financial standpoint, are there any studies regarding home value increase or decrease if the school system, in fact, once it burdens in with another school system, do they increase or decrease? Because I think that everybody here is worrying about their tax dollar money, so I don't buy a house in a low tax area. And I've never bought a home in an area where I'm like, wow, they have the best roads there. Yeah. I buy a house where I'm like, they have the amazing school system with low classroom. It's funny because 
um, I'm talking too much about Eastland and Salem, but we actually thought we ought to buy property in Salem because we knew that the property value would go up when we signed this agreement, and there was some guarantee that the kids would be able to come to Eastland High School for the foreseeable future. And, it, and they did, but no, there have been no studies done along those lines, none. That's why I want to reiterate that. Ask you have another question way in the back. Ma'am, there's someone in the back? I just wanted to speak to this young lady's point. That's why we, as the, as the board, our, our mandate is to maximize student performance. And, and these other things are, are not really, we, we're of course concerned about costs and we're concerned about all kinds of things. Uh, but our mandate legally is to maximize student incomes. That is to say, make sure that the schools are awesome and stay awesome, which is why people do come to East Grand. <coughs> Thank you for your point. Anyone else? Steve? Um, Steve Mosier, Seneca Drive. Um, Mary, could you highlight um, <clears throat> what your assessment was on why Preston went the way they were? What were the, what were the key uh, elements that you believe that you know, led them in directions they, they eventually made. Yeah. Interesting because, again, I really had no idea how they were going to decide to come down on this because they were just at the upper level on all of those different categories that we talked about. I think that they felt that they wanted to find um, somebody who could be a full time educational leader. And when, since they had two schools, it was hard to imagine having a coherent curriculum and having progress on curriculum um, beyond, I mean, with a part-time person overseeing that. And when, and they also anticipated some turnover in their um, principal, one of their principal positions, and felt that whoever came in was going to need um, nurturing, and and that you need to have a um, full-time superintendent to support your administrative team every day as opposed to only a few days a week. I did see that in a, I did a search with a small community that had a brand new principal. Um, it had a part-time superintendent who you know, was very capable and, and, all, and just there two days a week. And the principal was struggling because he didn't have the ongoing um, mentoring. That th there are there are wonderful advantages of these tiny um, places that want to have part-time superintendencies, and there are challenges that they have because they have to do everything everybody else does in terms of complying with state law and you know keeping keeping um, the district running in an effective way, and to do it on a part-time basis is just it's a challenge. It's a lot. They have to juggle a lot. I think that's why when Pat Charles was here, she ended up doing more than her two and a half days because she uh, had all to do everything that a, a superintendent did with regard to all those reports and all those complying with all those state mandates. Uh, and so she just worked beyond what it was that we were paying her to do. And, you know, that was just the reality. But she wasn't going to be embarrassed. She did what she had to do to get the job done, even though we may not have paid her that. She was a true professional. We appreciated what she did for us. Well, there's a lot of missionary zeal out there. Sir, in the back. Hi, uh, Glenn's on Wingport Road. Um, does everybody in the room ex understand exactly what the delta in the map is? What we're, what are we discussing over? I mean, what's the difference between a full-time superintendent, shared superintendent, or Shared superintendent. What is what are, what are the deltas between those different services? Because that's really what the point is, right? You mean salary differences? Yeah. Yeah. What's 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 the financial differences? What are we trying to say? Mary, well, you probably, well, I don't know. What the I'm sorry. Is. Mary what could probably numbers? address that better than anybody. Okay. And given the size of our district, and given the sizes of the districts that you've been speaking about, all of which are smaller than us, not in our dirt, um, but, you know, for comparison purposes, they're small towns. They're not in the same socioeconomic area. They're not per capita median income that we are in our community, but they are 
comparable size-wise, and I guess the district numbers-wise, it might speak to. So you can throw some numbers. Right. What, what a full-time superintendent would expect to get in a town such as uh, East Lyme. Uh, what a, uh, a, an assistant uh, superintendent would get in a community, again, such as East Lyme, and what presumably a uh, part-time or shared, if you prefer, superintendent might get. And you can ballpark it. I think that would answer the question, wouldn't it? Um, I'm not asking for me. Yeah. I'm asking for everybody in this room. Uh, what, you are pose, we, what are we discussing? You pose the issue, so do you have terms? some numbers on that? I can tell you that if you were to, all right, so what would your top teacher be making? 100,000. 100,000? 100, 100,000. 100,000. 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, so the maximum a part-time superintendent would be able to make would be 220 percent of 100 times 45 times 45 percent which would bring you to about 99,000 so about 100,000 for for a, a part-time part -time superintendent right. okay for a full-time it would um, probably be around 185 to be attractive in this area I would think would be 185 maybe slightly higher so but then you have the offsetting expenses of, you know, if you don't have, so you have to do a cost comparison that's not just on the salaries, it's also how does the other work get done, what are some offsetting expenses? Yeah, in lieu of a full-time superintendent, there might be other support services that are necessary. So exactly. that's, what, that's what I'm trying to get at. What are we, is it $40,000 a year? Because in a $19 million budget, yeah, the other thing about a full-time, a full-time superintendent probably, I don't want to say part-time superintendents don't have a handle on their finances. They absolutely do, and I think that's one area they probably spend their most time. And if anything suffers, it's probably the educational program. Um, I said it. <laughs> but, um... Would you outside it? Yeah. <laughs> You're just on TV. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I know I think they would admit that it's hard to really um, be the educational leader and I think much more of that is left to the principals, which is fine, but it's, that's what happens. Um, how does the compensation, um, how is it handled when there's a shared superintendent or is there any examples of any districts that do share superintendents? Because it doesn't sound like even the 21 districts that you mentioned, um, their, their setup seems to be more toward regionalization just for the high schools, as you stated. There's not, right. Nobody's doing shared at all. But there's a just statute the that Connecticut passed that, ad, well, it doesn't advocate, but the statute exists that there is a provision for shared superintendents. So legislatively speaking, why was that even made law? It's brand new. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, there may be some. I, I, I can't. I can't speak for our legislators. Right. No, I. I think, <laughs> There's one in the room. Uh, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> may, I, may I answer? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. That was actually a proposal that came out of the Senate, Senate uh, Democrats' office. Um, we don't actually qualify for that. We would need an exception. You have to have no more than two buildings. Oh, because the statute is yeah. specific. Yeah, we would qualify on, on sides, but not on, but they do, they do exceptions. Okay. Has anybody, do you know if anybody has come over? Has I don't know. I haven't heard of any. I haven't heard of any at all. I, yeah, it, it was only um, the 2017 um, year, I believe, recent. Yeah. Okay. So I, just to follow that up, haven't past superintendents in town made more than that when we tried? No. Base salary, no, but base salary. as a total compensation. And package, I'm talking yes. base. I'm talking okay. base. I looked at, you know, I have, again, data from across the state that's a little, again, I'm, you're always dealing with data that are a couple of years old. You just, mm -hmm. it takes time to collect the data. People really don't like to tell so, you what they're making. So yeah, it's, it's hard to get the data, no, sure. but, um, but that's about <coughs> two year old data. Okay. Bill. A uh, question and maybe a follow-up. Uh, did I understand you to say that part-time superintendents most likely do not attend board meetings? No, 
I did not say that. Um, I misunderstood you. Yeah. Um, and they do usually attend board of ed meetings, but it's difficult if you, I mean, I know there are some communities that have the superintendent one day a week, and they time that day for the night meetings. So there, there was a slide. Okay. I'm sorry. There was a slide that suggested mm -hmm. that night meetings, but okay. definitely the superintendent needs to be at a regular schedule. For okay, I misunderstood. Yeah, thank you. You picked it up correctly, but, but, it was but you did pick it, it up. It you did pick it up. So I would, I would interpret that to mean that they wouldn't, you know, wouldn't necessarily be sitting in at finance board of finance meetings or board of selectmen meetings or oh, 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 other yes. meetings that you know of our interest to the superintendent of the Board of Education. And they might make that a priority to be and, here. and some do, and, so and I'll say that as to yeah. Dr. Charles. She was she always, yeah. always willing to go, even though, quite frankly, she didn't, you know, didn't have to, <coughs> but she felt that it was part of the responsibility of the superintendent, which mm -hmm. I think everyone sitting up here would say it is, of course. But it was not an, uh, a requirement for her to do. And there were certain days that she was unavailable to be in town, and yet she'd make herself available if she had to for um, for a meeting that was you know, well, integral because to those uh, relationships are so important. And in addition to all of the other responsibilities that you saw on that slide that nobody could read, it's hard to find the time. I mean, I know in, in some of the districts which had excellent part-time superintendents, there was a real frustration on the part of the parents that they didn't know the superintendent. Yeah. Because the superintendent did not have time to get to know the parents. Good. Good. Comments on that? Um, just, yes, I just um, lovely marks from Melody Lane. I just wanted to get an idea of where you are in the process. I, so this is the beginning steps, and you're evaluating. Yes. So you must have a job description, and you must have an idea of what's been done, and getting input from the current interim superintendent to see what's required and what's. All that will be put together hours. with our consultant after she does focus groups with the community, meets with people, <laughs> look, looking at what the community is looking for, and then the Board of Ed is going to have to make some decisions. That's so yeah, we're just at the beginning steps now. As to what the process is going to be in dates, I'm sure she'll give us some ballpark figures. Uh, we're actually having a meeting tonight after this to just look at some of those things, so we're not aware yet. We, we <laughs> wanted to talk about this topic tonight because it is a hot button topic in the community. Uh, we are all volunteers here. We've been elected. We all pay taxes. We're all sensitive to the tax issue wherever we live, where we have. And certainly the board, we deliberate a lot and talk a lot about how we can do things better. And uh, we're out there exploring. And we've explored for the past year with part-time superintendents and a full-time interim superintendent. So we're collecting a lot of data to see how it goes and hopefully make the best decision that's going to be best for the kids here in East Granby and the community. Can I, can I just do a, a quick little exercise? Because I see a lot of, there are a lot of people in the room and I appreciate everybody coming out. If you or your spouse graduated from East Granby High School, could you stand up for me? If you or your spouse graduated from East Granby High School. <laughs> and I'd ask you to remain standing if you had a child or have a child that's still in our school system. Is this for like the people who are? Nope, just for the people that stood up that were graduates of our school district and now they have children that have either graduated from or have children in our school district. I thank you all for coming. Your, your kids will be second generation East Granby High School grads. And I think that's just absolutely stunning and marvelous. So it's great that you all came out. It's a testament to our community that our graduates go away, they head off to wherever they go, get in trouble, come back, find their way back to our community, find a place that they can... You stood up, right? My wife did not graduate. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. That's right. But I think it's a, I think it's a testament to, um, to our entire community, not just to our school district, but of course I think to our school district also, that so many people in our town come back to our town and decide this is where I want to raise my kids and this is the school that I want my kids to go to. And I know, looking at a lot of you, I know that some of you, your kids are younger, most of them are younger, um, some are older, some have, uh, children have graduated from our, um, our district. And How I, is this on agenda? You bet it is. Excuse me, yep. he sees a board member, he can speak I can, as a board member. I can member. comment. Oh. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. Thank you. Yeah. Just making an He's a board member, he can speak. Absolutely. He's got my 
Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you. Mary, um, in conjunction with the question that the young lady asked um, in the back of the room, when you were talking about the process and how we're just beginning the process to search for a superintendent, can you advise um, the board and the public about the focus groups and how that will work and what yeah. that entails? There are actually a couple of ways that we'd like to gather information. One, because not everybody can get to a focus group, is a survey that would be open to the whole community, so the schools and the community. And that gets at you. Know, and in general, we ask the same questions, more or less. Um, the survey is a little bit more in depth. In the, in the focus groups, I ask about um, what would attract somebody to East Granby? What are you proud of in the community? You know, what, what's going, going really well here? And then um, what are the challenges a new leader would face? And then um, the third question is, what kind of human being do you want in the role? You know, people come with their skills, and you can learn skills. But what kind of, and, and I want to know what kind of skills you think are needed, but also um, what kind of philosophy, what kind of values, what kind of human being? So those are really the three questions that are asked in focus groups. One of the things I'd like to do with the board this evening is figure out a list of potential focus groups. So we want to make sure all stakeholders have the opportunity to be heard and to weigh into this process and give perspectives. So um, I do have a reputation for listening really carefully, and I tend to involve or include anything I hear as themes. You hear it a couple of times, and it goes in this leadership profile. The board's going to get the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so will your candidates, so there are no surprises. So I, I think the, the community has the opportunity to really um, share all of their different perspectives. And it's a great needs assessment for the community and the schools. I'm looking forward to it. Will there be a student focus group? I hope so. Jim. Hi, Bob. Well, Bob Raven Seeger makes, I think, the crucial point of all of this. The student achievement is the ultimate goal in the community, in the board, in the superintendent. So I, I have a question which relates to superintendents. Uh, so why aren't superintendent evaluations, including student, student achievement, a matter of public record? May I ask you? Um, From a K point of view, if you can. The, the, the process itself or the outcome? The Meaning of? Uh, we evaluate a superintendent, and there are at least six or seven criteria by which student achievement, community involvement, et cetera, financial. Why is it? Why aren't those? Why aren't those regularly made available to the public? Because that's it's a, it's a simple question, and I think it should be a matter of public record. So you mean the report that comes out of the process? The the evaluation of the superintendent. Why is that met? Um. I think if it's written down, it is public. Not here. And if it's verbal. Not here. And why? Is that true, Bob? I'll address that. Jim's exactly correct. Uh, if it's not a written record, it's not published. Uh, years ago in East Granby, I know Rich Galuccio, former Board of Ed Chair, knows that there were always written evaluations of superintendents. Uh, I believe that this board that's sitting here, the new superintendent we're going to be hiring, there will be written evaluations of the superintendent. superintendent. They've been done orally in the past, therefore there's no record to share. I believe that they should be written. I think they should be evaluated. We, ev we evaluate all our staff, and I think the Board of Ed certainly needs to evaluate the superintendent. And I think most people here will agree with that. But that's the decision going to be made down by the board, not by me, down the road. But I do agree with that. Jim, you were privy to the superintendent's contract, and so you know that if, in fact, there was a deficiency noted, then there would be a written record, which would then be given. And that's as far as I'm going to discuss the contract. Well, I was on the board. You, was, were on, was, you were on the board, and I know you it were It was in the current practice, uh, not, not to my liking, it, it, it wasn't. It wasn't necessarily to my liking either, Jim. But verbal. It should not have been verbal. It should have been written down. It should have been. A, should have been made a, a matter of public record. Period. End of sentence. 
You're right, Jim. As you look we up here, you see. We actually bound by the contract. We were. We were bound by that contract. By verbal? Uh, no, no, we no. were bound by the contract. He's the correct. But there are six the new members here on the board who had no knowledge of that until we came on the board that there wasn't a written evaluation. So I think you'll see a change in that. That's all. That's something we're certainly aware we of. Were bound, we were bound by contract. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we were. Uh, I'll talk to you afterwards about it. We'd be glad to. I'll, I'll check. I, I have the previous superintendent's contract. I'll check it, but I, I don't believe it was a requirement that the evaluation be be worked. It wasn't a requirement to be heard. It was only a requirement that it would be written. It would be written in the event that there was a deficiency and the board determined there was a deficiency. Then there would have to be a written evaluation describing the deficiency. And that's, again, as far as we can. That is the way the contract is, but I think the new contract would be different. I am paraphrasing, but I'm pretty darn close. I think John's correct with that. Anyone else comments or questions? Just a comment. I'm Carly McKinney, I live on Seneca Drive. Um, I have students in this district, but I'm also an educator um, in a Farmington Valley school system. It's public, it's not legalized. Um, I kind of wanted to make a comparison because we have a small town, but um, I teach special education and I run a very small program with students who have social and emotional difficulties. I probably have the smallest caseload um, in my building, but I could not do that job part time. There is no way. Um, the other statement I'd like to make is that this town, um, I've only been there four years, but although this is my 13th year of teaching, um, we've gone through two superintendents and one interim and five principals in the four years that I've been there. So to say that we're looking or potentially looking at part-time really kind of gets me in the gut because you can't manage it with a part-time person or with that much disruption in a school. Um, and it, that weighs on the kids tremendously. Um, and so I just, that's my input. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Matt McKinney, so I could drive being the husband of a teacher. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think what, I, well, what, why we brought our kids back here for the school system, um, the staff and the teachers in these schools are absolutely amazing. And it shows in the kids, it shows in us, and it's the same thing. These teachers wear multiple hats. They do everything they need to support. Um, and when you're, you know, I can see from her, what affects a teacher is not getting support, those teachers leave. So if you set yourself a situation where maybe it looks better on paper, because bottom line, it always looks good on paper, but it might look different, your good teachers start to leave because they're not getting the support they need, and then we don't have the same school system that we had that we've grown up in. And these teachers are great and need, like I said, everybody in this town wears multiple hats for anything here, because we're just a small community, and they need that support from, I believe, a full-time student. Very good, thank you. So, if I could just add to what I was saying about the focus groups and the survey. The result of all the data that's gathered um, is a leadership profile, which is a very comprehensive reflection of the data that are gathered. And I, the board needs to then accept that, and it's shared with candidates. But from that, we develop interview questions, and, and we analyze the um, candidates against the criteria that emerge from the leadership profile. So that's that's where all that the focus groups and survey information ends up. Just so that you that, and that would be posted on the school website and you know people will have access to the public documents. See some more hands up. Sir back. Russ Rourke, 154 Church Hills Road. Um, father of three that went to the East Granby school system. Just um, comment, observation. Um, you spoke about part of the role of superintendent is mentoring. Education doesn't end at 12th grade. It goes on throughout our life. And it was a testament to the individuals that went through this school system as well and here as citizens. So we're really, we're raising active adults so we're trying to raise. That's all I want to point out. Good point, thank you. Anyone else? I have a question about the focus groups. How are those, the members of each of those focus, focus groups selected? I would hope that it's an open invitation and the challenge is getting the word out to everybody, but I would be working with staff to, um, we will determine tonight sort of categories and see about getting the word out. So um, we'll also maybe try to get it posted, the schedule, so that keep an eye on the website. Get it up there. So basically what you're saying, if someone wants to be a member of a focus group, they can be a member of the yes. focus group. Yes. Yeah. 
Anyone else? Seeing none, I thank everyone for coming tonight. I'd like to ask a board member for a motion for adjournment. So moved. Motion made. Second. Second. Oh, I had one more question. There's supposed to be comments at the end of the We meeting. just finished comments. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Abstentions? Motion carried. Meeting adjourned. Thank you very much for coming tonight, everyone.